Ian point of view. This party sucks. I fidget to myself, glancing around the crowd. It's a lot more people than I'm used to seeing, which is having an effect on my nerves a little. There's only maybe 40 people here, but still. For me with the walled, ivory tower life I lead. Well, it's a lot. What's worse is that the party is my party. Or at least, it's being thrown for me by my father. Chicago District Attorney Thomas Murray says jump. Well, you jump. Or show up to his daughter's graduation party, as the case may be. But the premise and the invitations are wrong. This party isn't really for me. I mean on the surface it is. But just like everything when it comes to my father, this all boils down to his own political agenda. Everything always has. Where I attended school. The friends I had. The boyfriends I wasn't allowed to have. Smile for the press, Fia. Make sure you're on the debate team at school the press will eat it up when they see you following in my footsteps. Part of me wanted to fail, at anything, just to spite him. I dreamed of being the monkey wrench in his scheming and plotting. But I could never bring myself to do it. So instead, I did what he wanted me to do, succeed. And now here I am 22 years old after graduating college now law school early as well. All the right grades. All the right degrees from all the right schools. All the right friends, no boys. Why the fuck are you not drinking? I grin and turn. Well, not all the right friends. Zoe would be the one exception to my dad's strict rules on who I see or hang out with. I may have been homeschooled because my father rarely allows me to even leave our uptown townhouse. He may have pulled serious political strings to get college and law school to let me take classes remotely. I might have had my extracurricular activities and my friends handpicked to make his political career look the best it could. But somehow, Zoe Stone slipped through the cracks. It's not like she's completely bad news or anything. On the surface, she's even exactly who my father would want me to hang out with from the right family, has the money goes to the right schools, and all of that crap. But she also has the freedom I don't, complete with the ability to make bad choices, date glamorous older men, and party when she wants to. She's almost certainly a bad influence. But sometimes, you need a little bad influencing. It should make zero sense that my father would allow me to even live in the same zip code as her. But Zoe's mom and mine were best friends. Cancer took them both around the same time, almost 10 years ago. I guess even image is everything Thomas Murray wasn't stone cold enough to block me from hanging out with Zoe here and there after that. Oh my god, I'm so glad you're here. Zoe grins and hugs me close. And miss this debacle. Of course I'm here. And of course, to support your dear friend Fiona while she's made to play a pawn in a game she hates. Zoe grins. That too. So, she turns to glance over the huge crowd of guests. How many of these people do you actually know? Like four of them. Not including me. Three. She laughs and turns to snag two champagne flutes off a passing tray. Here. Cheers and congratulations. She clinks her glass to mine. And I'm really proud of you. You know, I grinned allowing myself to bask in the praise. My dad might have a ton of money and political influence. But I earned the accolades. I worked my ass off to graduate college early, get into law school, and then graduate that early too with honors. Thanks, I smile. And how many of these people you don't know have come up to gush congratulations? Oh, all of them. So long as my dad was looking. Zoe smirks. So, he's really doing it, huh? Yep, I mutter dryly. Like I said, none of this is really for me. I'm the centerpiece, I guess. I'm the excuse for bringing all of these people here to my father's townhouse. But the real goal here is money. Unofficially, this is Thomas Murray's first fundraising gala for his bid to run for mayor of Chicago. And having me here plays so well into that it might as well be movie scripted. There's not a single thing my father won't or hasn't used for his own agenda. After my mom died, Thomas Murray became the poster boy for the hard-working single father. He played himself up like this Kennedy figure who was also raising his daughter all by his lonesome tirelessly. It was all bullshit, of course. My father didn't raise me, an army of nannies, private tutors, and finishing class instructors to make sure I was ladylike enough for high society did. Not to mention the private chefs, maids and personal shoppers because God forbid I go out to buy my own clothes. Hey. You look fucking hot by the way. 
I grin, blushing. Thanks. Now finish that, she nods at my flute. Just got it. And I'm going to go get us more, so, she makes a speeded up motion with her hand. I laugh as I knock back the champagne and hand her the glass. I choke slightly, and she grins. Just gotta open the throat, Wyan. Yeah, thanks. Relax the jaw, use lots of tongue. Eye contact as always. Oh my god. She laughs as my face burns hotly. Fancy law school degree at 22, lots of job prospects. And a dad who's going to be mayor. The only thing we need to do now is finally get you laid. I groan, feeling my face burn. I'm fine, thanks. She giggles. No, you're not. Trust me. Okay, I'll be back with more booze. I shake my head and watch my friend disappear into the crowd. You look thirsty. I turn at the man's voice. He's handsome, and smug looking, and he reeks of old money. His blonde hair is perfectly swept back and to the side, his square chin right off of a reality TV show poster. Chet, he smiles. He passes me a champagne flute. Oh, thanks, but my friend. He ignores me and presses the glass into my hand. And congratulations on your graduation. I smile. Um, thank you. So, has anyone scooped you up yet? Hmm. He grins. Any firms? Oh no. Not yet. I haven't actually taken my bar exam. Well, they will. I smile back at him. Well, thank you I appreciate. I mean with your dad being mayor and all. Being cut off is such a pet peeve but I force a smile. Well, we'll see. It won't hurt, right? I mean. And you're smart, graduated the right school, he winks. Beautiful. I blush, even though I know it's a lame line. Thanks. You know, my firm is actually looking. Cooper and Cooperman. Yeah, I'm a senior partner there. Of course he is. The man has smug rich, privileged douchebag written all over him. Oh, wow, really? I ask with zero actual interest. This is exactly the kind of man my father ultimately wants me to be with. It wouldn't even surprise me if he's the one that sent him over to talk with me. Yep, Chet grinned smugly. I could probably pull some strings. Talk to the partners, get you in there for an interview. My jaw drops in shock. Oh my god are you serious? He grins. Of course. What are you doing tomorrow night? My heart races. Oh my god, nothing. Nothing at all. I could definitely come in and talk. I was thinking more going out. Oh. Okay, yeah, I could also. You know with your dad taking office you and me could be quite the power couple. The record scratches in my head. Yep, there it is. And naive me walked right into it. There's no pulling strings with the partners. He just wants to take me out. Even as I'm thinking it. I see Chet glance back around the room. Sure enough, there's my dad watching. My dad put you up to this, didn't he? Oh no. No way. Chet quickly. Backtracks. I just wanted to introduce myself. Is your firm really hiring? Yes. I mean for you. I groan. Well, it was really nice to meet you, but... Don't you have a sewer to crawl back into, Chet? Zoe suddenly shoves her way between us glaring at him. Zoe Stone, he growls frowning. She's not interested. Fly away. Why don't you let her speak for trust me, she's not interested. You're not her type, Chet. He glares at her, and then turns to me. Why don't we let YN tell us what her type is? Because I already know it's not the type who like his girls young, rich and unconscious, Chet, she hisses. He bristles, snarling at her. Listen to me, you little. Duck off, Chet. Now. Nunt he mutters. He glares at Zoe before he turns and slinks away. Ugged up that guy, she groans. My dad sent him over. Well, your dad has really terrible taste in men for you. I sigh. He checked all the boxes rich successful, and apparently a by frown into my friend's face. Wait, did you and? Oh my god no. Not me, she makes a face. Crystal Schoenberg used to date his brother though. Lots of family donations to sweep his predatory bullshit under the rug. I blanch. Wait, that was Chet Brubaker. Yep. I groan. As in. Son of Melvin Brubaker, CEO of Adonis Capital. That's the one. Roll my eyes and turn to glare at my father. 
He's not even looking though. Glad to see we've evolved past arranged marriages for political means, I grumble. I mean does it actually surprise you? How many guys has your dad tried to set you up with because of their family's money or political connections? More than I want to count. She sighs. So, you're going to tell him today? That's the plan. Well, I'm here if you need me. Thanks, Zoe. The plan is to finally tell my father I'm leaving my gilded cage. I mean I'm 22, I have a law degree, and it's ridiculous that I'm still living under his roof as basically a captive doll. So, I'm leaving. Even if it means getting cut off completely, I have to get out. And today, I'm telling him that. No more suitors pushed on me. No more being a pawn for his political career. I want my life, and I want it now. I arch as my father shakes some hands. Wilson, his chief of staff comes up and whispers something in his ear. My father frowns and nods quickly then he turns and makes a beeline for his office down the hall. Where's he off to? Oh, probably has Satan on the phone, offering my firstborn child in exchange for a state senate seat. Zoe snickers. Well, no one's allowed in his office, right? True. So, wouldn't now be an opportune time? I bite my lip. She's right. He'll be alone and cornered. If I'm going to do this, it might as well be now. I turn and pass her my glass. I'll be back. Be brave. Thanks. Slink away through the crowd. No one tries to congratulate me or stop me, not without my father watching. And that's fine with me. I slip down the hall until I'm right outside his office door. I go to open it, but suddenly I hear voices arguing inside. Look, I already told you my father is saying sharply. I can get you money now, or if you want to wait until after the election, whatever contracts you want are. I am not interested in gambling on your political aspirations, Thomas. I freeze. The other man's voice is dark and gritty, with some sort of Korean or other Asian accent. My dad laughs nervously. Gambling. Please. This is a sure thing. And trust me, once I'm in, those contracts are going to be so sweet you'll get cavities. I already told you, I am not interested, the man with the smoky, dark, powerful voice sighs heavily. We had an arrangement, Thomas. I know, I know, and I'm trying. I did you a favor. I know that. And I'm so appreciative, I just. A dead is owed, the voice snarls quietly. And today, I am here to collect. Look, I'm trying okay. If you just give me a month, Mr. Kim. I freeze, dread filling me. The behind door crooked dealings with my father, the Korean accent, and now, a name I've seen in newspapers. The man my father is speaking to is the single most dangerous, violent, and notorious man in organized crime in Chicago. Perhaps even the whole country. He's talking to Kim Taeyong, the vicious, powerful head of the Kashinko Bratva. I'm not interested in giving you a goddamn thing, Thomas the Korean mobster hisses. Except a further three seconds to tell me how I'm going to get my money today. 1. Mr. Kim, please. This is not how things are done. Do not lecture me, Thomas. We had an arrangement. That is how things are done. 2. Mr. Kim. I hear the sudden metallic click of a gun on the other side of the door. I gasp loudly. Too loudly. The barking sound of a snarled command in Korean echoes through the door. Footsteps cross the room, and I gasp as I pull away from the door. But it's too late. The office door yanks open, and two burly, terrifying men suddenly grab me. I scream, and my father is yelling, but they ignore us both. They yank me inside, and throw me to the ground. The two of them storm over to me when suddenly, there's a barked command. Miamchida. Stop. The deep, gravelly voice booms through the room. I feel my heart pounding in my throat as I slowly look up. The two burly men move aside and suddenly, I'm looking at a tall, broad-shouldered, completely gorgeous tank of a man. He's even taller and bigger than his two bodyguards, and you can almost see the power rippling off of him. His deep dark eyes look right at me captivating my gaze. Who are you? Mr. Kim, my father fumbles, almost tripping over himself as he stutters over. This is YN, my daughter. The brooding Korean's eyes glimmer. They narrow at me as a shadow of a smile curls at his lips. Thomas, he growls. Our debt is settled. Young's point of view. Smile thinly up at the gilded townhouse. Being the district attorney for Chicago pays well.
though I'm quite sure it does not pay this well. But I know all about the other business of the man who lives here. I know of his backroom handshakes, and sweetheart contracts. I know he fancies himself a Kennedy. My smile fades. If Thomas Murray doesn't play his cards right in about five minutes, he'll have a lot more in common with JFK than he'd like, such as an extra hole in his head he didn't have this morning. I turn to Lev and scowl. Give him one last chance. Yes, Taehyung. Lev pulls a cell phone out of his suit jacket and hits a button. I look back up at the front of the Murray townhouse and smile thinly once again. Years ago, I may have envied this man with his wealth and this opulent home. It may have sparked a hunger in me, a drive to conquer and build my own empire. But I've done those things now. I've reached the top. Now, when I look at Thomas Murray's $12 million Chicago townhouse, I just smile. I smile because now, my house is bigger than this. My wealth is vaster than his. And my power is even greater than his wildest aspirations. Thomas Murray can be mayor of Chicago if he wishes. He can think that brings him power if it helps him sleep at night. But the real power will be with the man who owns that mayor. And that man is me. Next to me, Lev grunts and hangs up. He turns to me with a stoic look. That was his butler. Mr. Murray is, indisposed, with a party. Why mood darkens even more. While I admit that sometimes I miss getting my hands dirty, I don't relish the idea of dragging a probable mayoral candidate out of his own party to put a bullet in him. But Thomas is out of time, and I'm out of patience. He had his chance to be a man about it, I growl. Let's go. Lev and two of my men fall into step behind me as I take the stairs to the townhouse's front door. A man answers, but his smile quickly fades when he realizes who I am. Sir, you're here to see Mr. Murray. Right now. The butler pales. Sir, Mr. Murray is indisposed. It's his daughter's graduation pa. I don't give a shit if his daughter is solving world hunger and ending a war. I snap. I snarl and loom over the trembling butler, letting him feel my wrath and power. I am seeing him, right now. See, certainly, sir, the man fumbles. Of course. Allow me to show you too. His office will do, I snap. The man swallows. Sir, Mr. Murray's office is private. As is our business, I growl with a warning tone. So bring me, now. The man quickly caves. Of course, Mr. Kim. This way. I follow the man, with Lev and the other two following close behind me. Elsewhere in the house, I hear jazz music playing, along with the dull murmur and din of the graduation party. I'm aware that Thomas has a daughter, though I've never crossed paths with her. Word is, few have. He's kept her locked away in this house, even homeschooling her, for most of her life. Given Thomas's tendencies for backroom deals with men like me, that's probably the smartest thing he's ever done. He's recently graduated from Columbia Law School. But even that was done remotely, with some strings pulled by the aspiring mayor. I roll my eyes as the butler brings us into Thomas's office. Imagine raising a child, giving them every advantage and the best schooling, just so they can be locked in a gilded cage. I think of my own, radically different upbringing, and I grit my teeth. I was afforded nothing. I wasn't given a single leg up, or golden opportunity. My childhood was a lesson in fighting for a bite of food, or piece of threadbare blanket against the chill of night. My upbringing was learning to fight and draw blood young, so the predators would stay away from me. That was life in the orphanage and foster systems of Korea. Some would call it hell. They'd be right, but in a way, I'm glad for it. Being raised by devils in hell forged me into the man I am today. It hardened me and taught me self-reliance and gave me the drive to claw my way to the top. Mr. Murray will be in as soon as. Bring him, I say flatly, glaring at the man. I ignore the chair he's obviously gesturing to and walk behind Thomas's desk. I sit in his chair and put my feet up on his desk. Bring him now. The butler pales and nods rapidly. Of course, Mr. Kim. He turns and scurries out of the room, closing the door behind him. I sigh and sit back in his chair. My eyes scan the room and his desk. The walls are filled with pictures of Thomas shaking various important people's hands, former presidents, important businessmen, a few celebrities. But there's not a single one of his family. Not one picture of his late wife, or of his daughter. I begin to think that Thomas locking his daughter away in this tower is less about protecting her, and more about regimenting his life. E door opens, and Thomas walks in with a white face. He glares at my feet on his desk when he sees where I'm sitting, but he quickly hides the look. I hope you don't mind that I've made myself comfortable. 
He stammers. And no. No. He smiles that bullshit politician smile at me. No, not at all, Taehyung. Can I get you anything? How about four million dollars? Thomas freezes for a moment. But then he laughs, like I've just made a joke. My eyes narrow. I'm not sure what's so amusing about that, Thomas. His stupid smile drops quickly. Ah, well, Taehyung, you know I'm a man of my word. I don't know that, actually, I snap. Actually, I've only found the opposite with our dealings. And you can refer to me as Mr. Kim, I growl with a warning tone. Six months ago, it wasn't Thomas Murray favored to sweep the mayoral elections next month. A man named Lewis Hall, a former state's attorney turned state representative was a shoe in Alas, the unfortunate representative Hall hung himself after pictures surfaced of him cavorting around naked and ball gagged with an 18-year-old pro-ITUTE in a hotel room full of narcotics. Bad luck for Lewis, but great luck for Thomas, who became the new favorite to win. Except, luck played no part in this. The girl was provided by me. So was the rope, so were the hands that tied it into a noose, as well as the ones that forced him kicking and screaming into it. The deal for getting rid of Mr. Hall was that Thomas would use his heavy influence with the current mayor to get one of my companies a lucrative shipping contract with the city. Lucrative to the tune of four million over the next two years. Not a bad trade for murdering one stupid politician. Sept, the contract never happened. Instead, it went to an existing city contractor. Which means our deal is not complete. I did Thomas a favor, a big one, too. Now, he owes me four million dollars, or else Chicago is going to find itself with yet another suicidal mayoral candidate. Look, I already told you, Thomas Bleats. He's backpedaling, like the sniveling political hack that he is. I can get you money now, or if you want to wait until after the election, whatever contracts you want are. I am not interested in gambling on your political aspirations, Thomas. Gambling. Thomas laughs. This is a sure thing. Mayor Pasaktor endorsed me last week. It's in the bag. And trust me, once I'm in, those contracts are going to be so sweet, you'll get cavities. I already told you, I snarl. I slide my feet off of desk, sitting tall in his chair. I am not interested. I glare at him coolly. We had an arrangement, Thomas. I know, I know, he says quickly. And I'm trying. I did you a favor. I stand. Lev stays watching from the side, but the other two I've brought instinctually move behind Thomas, in case he tries to run. I know that. And I'm so appreciative. I just. A debt is owed, I snarl. And today, I am here to collect on it. Look, I'm trying, okay. Thomas's voice is getting louder. He glances behind him, seeing my men there, and his cool starts to break. I if you just give me a month, Tay, Mr. Kim. I am not interested in giving you a goddamn thing, Thomas, I hiss. Except a further three seconds to tell me how I'm going to get my money, today. I level my eyes at him. Slowly, I reach into my jacket and pull the 9mm out from its shoulder holster. Thomas's face turns white. One. Mr. Kim, he gasps. Please. This is not how things are done. Do not lecture me, Thomas. We had an arrangement. That is how things are done. I raise the gun at him. Two. Mr. Kim. I cock the gun with a click, more for dramatic effect than anything. But then suddenly, I hear it, the unmistakable sound of a gasp from the other side of Thomas's office door. This meeting is not so private after all. I nod curtly at the two men behind Thomas. Wordlessly, they turn, scowling as they storm over to the door. One of them throws it open, and suddenly they're yanking a figure inside and tossing her down across the floor. They slam the door shut and march over to her, when suddenly, my voice booms out. Miyamshuda, I roar. Stop. The room falls silent. And in that silence, the only thing I can see is her. The girl is stunning. She's sprawled across the floor in a shimmering silver and white cocktail dress, one heel has fallen off. Her hands are splayed across the hardwood floor, and her long hair falls across her face. But then she looks up. My eyes find hers, and I suck in my breath with a hiss. The roar of a beast rumbles inside of my chest. My muscles clench, as does my jaw. I stare at this angel from heaven, and I feel the world shift beneath my feet. Every pain ever inflicted on me fades. Every demon hounding my shadows falls silent. Every scar stops throbbing with pain. Who are you? The words come unbidden. But it's the most important question I've ever asked in my life.
I need to know her, every single inch and piece of her. I need to know her, and I need to make her all mine. Mr. Kim. Thomas's voice cuts through the silence, infuriating me as it breaks my focus on the girl. But my eyes never leave her, and she blushes as she slowly slips her shoe back on. She gets to her feet, smoothing her dress. But still, my eyes can't look away. My heart can't stop racing. My hunger for her won't be abated. Mr. Kim, Thomas needles again. He smiles through his fear of me, like a good little political pawn. He shuffles over and puts a hand on the girl's back. He's oblivious to the rage it induces in me as he turns to beam at me. This is YN, my daughter. I blink. The roaring in my ears comes rushing back. The world fades to black around me, until all I see is her. A long-haired angel drawing me in like a moth to flame. My hands clench, gripping into fists at my sides. I drink her in, shaking inside as I turn to the district attorney. Thomas, I growl. My lips thin into a smile. Our debt is settled. Hey, baby girl. Thank you for watching. Do like and subscribe for next update. Comment your opinion about In's first impression on Taehyung.